think we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Maureen Fitzgerald with CityMAT, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the third post-training course webinar, Small Area Analysis with Dr. Kristen Rankin. As usual, the course is being recorded for archival purposes and for those unable to attend today. This webinar begins with all participants' phone lines muted, even our presenter. I hope you can all hear me. Kristen, if you can hear me, it would be great if you could unmute and let me know. Um, hopefully all of you have called in on the phone line as well as logging in on the computer so that you can participate in the audio portion of, of this presentation. We hear you, Maureen. Thank you, Kristen. Okay. So, housekeeping. To unmute your phone, if you need to ask a question or you are a presenter, you should press star 7 on your phone. And then when you're done, to remute your phones, press star 6. And if Dr. Rankin wants us to unmute all the lines for open conversation, we'll definitely give you a, give you a heads up um, so that if you're in a room with people, you can quiet any conversations or keyboard activity. We understand that people are very busy and, and we're often multitasking. Um, we ask at no time you place the webinar on hold. If you do have to step out, just keep the phone muted or disconnect your phone line and call back in as soon as you are able. Leave your computer up and rolling. Lastly, if you're disconnected, just dial right back in and you'll rejoin. This recorded webinar will become part of the 2016 archive to be posted to the City Match website, and it will remain indefinitely. For those of you who have been asking about the archive from Dr. Aberis in September webinar, we're still waiting for clearance to release this into the public archive. Kristen, at this time, the baton is yours. Please unmute your phone, or you, I guess you already have, and welcome. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. It's great to be back with all of you. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, the webinars in September and October on economic analysis and trend. Um, based on the feedback that we got um, after the economic analysis webinar, um, I think you all thought it was a great overview with some good tools, but wanted to go a little bit deeper. So I just wanted to um, make an announcement that the December webinar will now be kind of a deeper dive into economic analysis done by Scott Gross from CDC. Um, so um, there will be more information forthcoming about that, but we did um, swap out the last webinar um, so that you could get more on that important topic that I know you all were craving. Um, so with that said, today we're going to focus on small area analysis because that was another topic that came up as a priority when we surveyed you all back in August. Um, and so I'm going to cover this topic, oh, and I don't have a lot of experience um, doing this myself, but I've been fortunate enough to work with um, Deb Rosenberg, who you heard from um, last month about trend analysis. Um, who has, has done some work in some trainings in small area analysis, as well as Amy Salzman, who was a um, master student of mine who graduated in the spring. And she did a GSEP internship in the state of Wisconsin Health Department. And her, um, that was a summer internship, and her project was all about calculating small area estimates for the national performance measures that their Title V program in Wisconsin had chosen. Um, so she was tasked with developing county-level estimates for each of the NPMs. Um, and so we learned a lot through her. And um, she actually created a very helpful guidance document, which I um, gave to Maureen, and I believe you can download along with the slides today, um, that kind of talks about the different methods for small area analysis. And we'll go through um, those today as well. So you'll see it's kind of a hodgepodge of slides because I, um, in the spirit of shamelessly stealing, um, I've, I've pulled from several different um, resources of Deb's and Amy's and mine from the past. Um, and I hope this will give you a good overview of what you can do. And then if we have time at the end, I'd like to do a um, kind of live demo of synthetic estimates. Um, which is always fun because I'm sure you know something will go wrong, but hopefully you all bear with me. Um, so we'll switch to sharing my screen at that point. But first I'll go through the slides. 
Um, and please do interrupt me at any time. Just press star 7 to unmute yourself and um, interrupt me on the line. Or if you decide to write a question in the um, chat box, then Maureen will interrupt me so, um, so we can discuss it um, in line with the presentation. Okay, so just a little bit of background. Um, so geography may be related to health indicators either directly or indirectly. So directly, spatial variables um, such as physical features or infrastructure can independently be related to health status. Um, and then indirectly, geographic variation may be due to um, the demographic and health risk characteristics of residents. Um, and not the spatial vari variables as such. So we know that, um, that individual demographics cluster within um, geographic areas um, due to many different factors. And so geographic um, disparities or differences in health indicators may be due to the makeup of the community or um, directly due to um, things like uh, you know, healthcare access or um, other physical features that might create um, barriers to care. Or, um, you know, in the case of a very urban community, air pollution. You can think of all of the different um, potential environmental exposures as well that may be related to indicators. Um, and there's different purposes for doing small area analysis. Sometimes you want to provide local data to facilitate local action. Um, sometimes you want to identify pockets of risk or pockets of adverse outcomes, maybe to target an, an er, intervention. Um, you might want to compare indicators across areas to understand that variation within your state or within your county or within your city. Um, and the first task really is how you're going to define those small areas. So is it going to be based on homogeneous populations, um, administrative or political units, health service units, structural or topo topological features, or sample size? Um, typically, we're in the realm here of administrative or political units, such as you know, counties, zip codes, census tracts, um, and sometimes health service units if your state um, or if your county is divided into different health service areas you may be interested in estimating the health indicators for a particular area. So if you're defining um, small areas according to health service or political boundaries, you have a potential for leveraging resources. So there may be financial resources, you know, um, in your particular jurisdiction, which is defined by political boundaries. It might influence service delivery, um, maybe such as referrals. Um, and uh, the data collect collection conventions we have to understand might be different across areas. If you define according to structural or topological boundaries, there may be implications for access to services, or there might be a direct impact of physical features on health. Now, um, the latter, the structural or topological boundaries, usually um, is going to require some use of geographic information systems, GIS, um, which many of you may use and be familiar with, but that's going to be outside the scope for today's talk. Um, and we're really going to be kind of focused on those health service or political boundaries. So one thing that's very um, closely aligned with and um, almost uh, simultaneous to small area analysis is consideration of sample size because um, small area analysis may mean also small population numbers. If you think about a state such as Wyoming that is very sparsely populated, um, their state analyses sometimes are um, based on small numbers. Um, or if you want to divide further within the state into counties um, you, and you have an indicator that's somewhat rare, um, their sample size and considerations come into play. Um, and another factor is if you divide, you know, a very heterogeneous state such as Illinois into different, um, uh, you know, administrative boundaries such as counties or maybe um, 
you know, zip codes or something like that, you may have very unequal sample size across those different, uh, different areas. So then what happens when you compare them to each other to a standard? Um, and if you're using confidence intervals and statistical tests to, to dis decide whether an area has met a standard, such as a Healthy People 2020 objective or maybe a target that you've set for your um, jurisdiction, um, the sample size is really going to influence whether something is going to be considered to have met a standard and be non-statistically different from that standard. Um, based on, you know, which area you're in. So just to show you an example. If you had an objective for first trimester prenatal care of 90%, um, you can see on the left, if this is an area A, the sample size is 874. Maybe this is a more urban um, area that is more densely populated. And you'll see that denominator um, in the denominator is 874, that's your N. On the right, you have an area with 200 um, women given birth. Um, and you can see if you're going to compare, um, if they each have an estimate of 86% of women receiving first trimester prenatal care, you might be interested to know, well, have they met the standard? of 90%. Is that 86% um, you know, similar enough to the 90% using statistical testing um, to say that they've met that standard? So you can see even though both of them have 86% with first trimester prenatal care, um, you would conclude that for that smaller community on the right um, that they had met the standard because the p-value is 0 0.06, so the values 0 0.86 and 0 0.90 are not statistically different. Um, but on the left, you would say, oh, no, this community has not met the standard um, because the 86% is significantly different than 90%. So this is just something to remember if you are using kind of administrative boundaries and they have different sample sizes, that that's going to influence, um, if you're comparing to a standard, um, whether or not you're going to conclude statistically whether that standard has been met. Um, so of course we're, we're going to want to look at you know, the individual estimates themselves and you can do statistical testing to directly compare counties as well. Um, but it's just important to recognize this that um, if you do want to you know, do statistical testing on areas that, um, that it's not comparing apples to oranges if the, the sample size is different in those areas. So here's just another example. If you have an objective for low birth weight of 5% um, and each community has, um, has a low birth weight rate of 7%, you can see um, that the standard has been met again in that smaller community but not in a larger community because you have more statistical power to detect the difference. So another consideration for sample sizes is you, that you want to have stable estimates. Um, so indica if indicator values are consistent over time, you could think of different ways to increase sample size to get stable small area estimates. Um, so if you are using like PRAMs and you want county level estimates um, for a particular indicator, and you may have some large counties in your state that have enough women sampled in one year of PRAMs to provide that stable estimate. Um, but you may have several counties that even after combining 10 years of data, you wouldn't have enough women. And we're going to talk about how to, how to deal with that. But, um, if, but one approach is to combine over years um, or maybe even combine regions, like neighboring regions, if it makes sense for the problem you're trying to solve. So the only issue is that if there is a time trend um, across years, that when you combine years, you're going to lose that time trend, obviously. Um, so you may want to think if, if you are trending up or trending down in a particular indicator over time, you may be more likely to want to compare areas and still look year by year at the indicator rather than comparing years and looking across smaller areas. Okay, so
So that's all kind of just intro information and considerations that we go into this with. Um, today I wanted to discuss three options for small area analysis. And these are the options that um, Amy Salzman um, lays out in her resource document, um, uh, which should be available to you to download. Um, the first is direct estimation. Um, so that um, and I just kind of put some criteria for each of these methods. You're, that's going to require geographic identifiers in your data. Um, and it's going to require, you know, a ballpark of 50 or more observations for your small area of interest. Um, so can any of you think maybe at the state level of a data set that would have direct, uh, that would have geographic identifiers and might have 50 or more observations for counties in your state? Remember, if you want to respond, you press star 7 to unmute yourself. So what about one of our most common data sources in MCH? Comment in the chat box, BRFSS. Oh, good. Thanks. Yeah, I see you guys answering in the chat box. Okay, so I see BRFSS, vital statistics, and YRBS. Okay, interesting. So BRFSS um, is probably not going to have 50 observations per county, um, but you will have your county identifiers on there. Vital statistics was what I was going for um, because the number of births may be large enough, and it depends on your state, but maybe large enough where you would have within one year 50 births in every county. Um, or you, know, you might have to combine across years to get 50 births in every county. But that was the one I was really thinking of where we're most likely to be able to do direct estimation based on the actual data collected. Um, there was also a comment about YRBS, um, and I've recently been working with YRBS, and um, they are extremely restrictive when it comes to geographic identifiers, meaning that there are none. So I got an Illinois file and I got a Chicago file um, because uh, Chicago actually does, you know, there's two different contracts from CDC for YRBS, one for the city of Chicago and one for the rest of Illinois. Um, and so they're two different files, but they get combined and weighted into an overall Illinois file. But even in that overall Illinois file, I cannot distinguish Chicago from other because there are no geographic identifiers. And so they do that really for the, um, to protect the confidentiality of the adolescents taking the surveys. Um, but I don't have any sub-state indicators on, on YRBS. And that's the same file that Amanda Bennett and our state health department would get from YRBS too. So that's one of the ones um, where you would want to, and we'll talk about you know, which method we'll want to use for YRBS. Okay, so let's go on to synthetic estimation. So, and that's a good segue, because what if you don't have any geographic identifiers? So YRBS is a good example here. Um, you could use synthetic estimation to take the estimates at the state level and approximate for local areas based on those state estimates for your indicator. Um, but you need an external data source to describe the demographics of your areas of interest. Um, and this may be, in the case of YRBS, you would go to the census because you would want um, population data about adolescents in your state. Um, in the case of an indicator, um, in, in the case of PRAMS or any of the indicators that you can measure on PRAMS, you would want the vital statistics to provide your kind of um, demographic file because you would want the denominator to be among women who gave birth. Um, so we'll talk more about exactly how to do synthetic estimation in the um, in the following slides, but that's a it's an option for um, if you do have a data source without geographic identifiers. And then a third is multi-level modeling um, with empirical Bayes estimation. Um, so we learned a little bit about multi-level modeling on site back in June. And um, oh shoot, where were we? I was about to say San Diego. We were in San Diego, right? <laughs> the years start to blend, sorry. 
Um, okay, in San, San Diego, we learned a little bit about multi-level modeling. Today we're going to learn an extension of that that allows you to produce small area estimates if you have a data set with geographic identifiers, but you have areas with sparse data. So going back to BRFSS or PRAMS, these are good examples of data sets where you, you might have 50 or more observations um, for your more um, populated counties in your state, but you're going to have less for a lot of the more rural counties. Um, and so you can use all of the information to provide estimates at the county level um, that, are, that, that borrow kind of strength from the larger counties in your state. And again, we'll talk through that in detail. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention on this slide um, is that I said 50 or more observations um, per the small area for direct estimation. That really is going to depend on your indicator. Because if you're looking at something um, like infant mortality, which is measured per thousand, 50 is not going to be enough, and you're not going to be able to use just one year of data with 50 observations in your county to estimate you know, the infant mortality rate. So, um, so that's an important consideration. I threw that out as kind of a ballpark for our typical kind of performance measure indicators that are measured in percents. Um, uh, but, the, but that wouldn't work for something like infant mortality or anything else that's more rare. So before I delve into the nitty-gritty um, details of the methods, I just wanted to show you the summary table from um, Amy's document. And I'll walk you through this. So on the left, um, you have all the national performance measures that were identified by Wisconsin um, in, their, in their recent Title V needs assessment. Um, so you see the first one is injury hospitalization. The data source for that is hospital discharge data. Um, and she has the, the years, these were the years that they had available data for each of these data sources. And then on the right is the small area um, analysis method. Um, so with hospital discharge data, that data source is um, all of the hospitalizations in the state regardless of payer. Um, so uh, there's a lot of observations. Um, and this is all county level estimates. So they chose to use direct estimation for injury hospitalizations at the county level. Um, for smoking during pregnancy, the next one, they used vital statistics data and again had enough sample size in each county to do direct estimation. With developmental screening, they used a the national survey of children's health. Um, so National Survey of Children's Health is yet another um, state-based survey that doesn't have geographic identifiers um, at the sub-state level. Um, so you know, you'll get an, an Illinois file and you can estimate any of the indicators for your children in your state, um, but not at um, a level um, below that. So synthetic estimation is used for, for anything with NSCH as a data source, as well as the NSCSHCN. Um, and I'm looking forward to the new versions of those coming out, but I think that we'll still be in the same situation where there won't be substate identifiers, although I'm not completely up to date on that, so anybody can correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, so and lastly, you see the three at the bottom are the well woman visit, um, whether infants were ever breastfed, and safe sleep. So those are um, obtained from the sample surveys, the BRFSS and PRAM surveys. Now the sample sizes are larger on those surveys, and they provide geographic identifiers at the sub-state level, so for counties. Um, and so mul but, but many of the counties, as I mentioned before, will not have adequate sample size to produce a stable estimate with direct estimation. So they chose to use multi-level regression modeling approaches for those. Before I get into the, um, the details of the methods, are there any questions? Okay, then we'll move on. Okay, so just one quick slide about direct estimation. Um, because this is pretty straightforward. This is what we're doing all the time. Um, but it does rely on county level numerators and denominators obtained directly from the same data source.
And actually, I want to mention one, um, one exception to that, because if we go back and look at, this is kind of a side note, but if we look at injury hospitalizations, the hospital discharge data would be used as the numerator, but you would actually need a source, a population source of data for your denominators to understand what proportion, you know, what is the rate of hospitalizations per kids age 0 to 17, if that's your um, target of interest. So actually, you would need to use a different data source for the denominator, but you still wouldn't need to use small area analysis estimation um, methods. You would just need to be able to merge a denominator with that numerator data for the hospital discharge data. Now, that's not necessary with vital statistics because you have your full denominator within the file. You're usually estimating um, you know, indicators such as smoking during pregnancy for women who gave birth. I just want to mention that caveat. Um, direct estimation should only be used for subpopulations, and this could be, I've been talking about counties, but we could be talking about cities, community areas within cities, census tracts, um, as I know that many of you are at city or county health departments. Um, but, but you need to have sufficient sample size for each of those units. Um, combining data years, as we talked about already, can improve the stability as long as there's no trends that you're going to obscure by doing that. Um, and if you're using, you know, BRFSS or PRAMS, as you all know, we should be using the weighted data to estimate the proportion of the indicators and to estimate the population number of, of, um, of your target population who are actually, um, who actually meet the criteria for that indicator. Um, so direct estimation is pretty straightforward, so I'm going to move on to synthetic estimation. So here, as we mentioned before, the geographic identifiers for subareas are not needed. And what we're doing here is applying the prevalence estimates for our indicator um, at the state level to local areas um, and to improve the prediction for those local areas. We're going to use selected demographics, um, and this is kind of similar to indirect standardization. So let me just walk through this formula. The PI here is the synthetic estimation of the indicator in area I. So let's say that we're talking about counties. Um, you know, in Illinois, I think there's 102 counties. So um, in county one of 102, this, this is going to be the synthetic estimation um, of that indicator. Here we're going to sum over um, um, all the people that belong to demographic group J um, in, that, in that county. And then in the numerator, you have the number of people in your target population in area I that belong to demographic group J. And in the new denominator, you're going to have the total population in county I. And then the P dot J is the state level president prevalence rate for the demographic. So I will walk through that one more time, um, trying to get my arrows off. There we go. OK. So if you want the synthetic estimation for county one, um, you might take, so the demographic groups here might be, um, let's do age by race ethnicity. Maybe you're working with the National Survey of Children's Health you want county level estimates for your state. Um, so you divide um, the demographic groups into the three typical categories we use for age, which from NSCH was just 0 to 5, 6 to 11, and 12 to 17. And you cross that by race ethnicity. Um, th so then, and if you have that in four groups, then you'll have 12 different demographic groups. So the value of J will be 12. So you're going to, for each of those demographic groups, calculate, um, say, the percent of children getting a medical home in um, the percent of children who are aged 0 to 5 and white who, got a medical, who had a medical home, the percent of children aged 6 to 11 and white who had a medical home, et cetera. And you'll have 12 different estimates at the state level for that indicator by that set of, demographic, that set of 12 different demographic categories. 
So for each of the demographic categories, you're going to calculate the proportion um, of all the kids in, your, in that county um, that are in that demographic category. And so now the NIJ over the NI is requiring you to use an external source of data. And here's where we're going to draw on the census. Because from the census, we can go and get that for every county um, in Illinois, what proportion um, of kids are in each of those 12 demographic groups. Um, and so here, really what you're taking is the proportion um, across the total county population of 0 to 17-year-olds. Remember that target population should be 0 to 17-year-olds. What percent ha are 0 to 5 and Hispanic? And you would calculate that percentage, then multiply it by the prevalence estimates for 0 to 5-year-old Hispanics in your NSCH data from the state. And then you'll do that 12 times for each group and sum over those. Um, to get that prevalence estimate. And, and what you're really doing is weighting, you know, the prevalence estimates um, by the demographic uh, distribution in the state to get your overall synthetic estimate, which is your PI. Any questions before I move on? We're going to go through um, numerical examples as well, but I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Okay. Um, so w it, when you're selecting what these demographic stratifiers should be, here's some kind of recommendations or requirements. The subpopulation prevalence rates um, for the indicator in the state or nation should remain stable. So if I take the National Survey of Children's Health um, and I look now at the sample size, not at the weighted uh, N, but at the sample N, um, for my 12 groups that I just created of age by race ethnicity, I want to make sure that there's at least 50 kids in each of those groups so that my prevalence estimate for having a medical home in each of those categories would be um, stable. And medical home is interesting because it usually hovers around, you know, 50% or so, I think, depending on, you know, where you're at. So. Um, so you'll get some pretty stable estimates there because you don't have like a rare indicator. Um, so you may not exactly need 50, and this is where you kind of you know go go back and forth and kind of use some reasoning to see you know maybe one of your groups has 40 in it, and you have something an indicator that's at 45 percent. You know you're probably going to be okay. Um, the demographic variables must be available for each county. So this is where you have to do this matching game between how you can get the data from the census um, and how you can get it in your um, NSCH file so that you make sure that those 12 demographic categories can be exactly matched between each data source. Um, you should pick demographic variables that actually predict variation in the indicator because this is the, the goal of this approach is to try to estimate the indicator value at the county level based on um, the demographic distribution in the county. If the demographics don't have anything to do with the indicator, if they're not associated, then you're not going to get a very good prediction at the county level. So it's a little challenging sometimes because you're playing this balancing act about which, you know, how many demographic categories to include, like if you choose race, ethnicity, you know, do you keep that multiracial group? Well, you have to see if the multiracial group is going to match up with the census. You also have to see if you're going to have, you know, enough um, uh, sample size in your NSCH data for that group. And, and it's really going to be a balancing act. And then, you know, ideally you would use um, several predictors, um, but then you might run into stability issues as well. Um, and then the target population should be well-defined and matched between data sources. So again, if the indicator is a denominator of children 0 to 17 years and stratified by race, then it's essential to know the race distribution by county for 0 to 17-year-olds. You don't want the race distribution by county by the whole, for the whole population in a county. Um, so that goes for, you know, if you're working with children, if you're working with women of reproductive age, you want to restrict to to women age 18 to 44 or however you're defining that. Um, so uh, you just want to, and I say 18 to 44 there because if you're using BRFSS, 
um, as, your, as your data source for the indicator. It, it starts at 18, so then you want to match it to census data for 18 to 44. Any questions? Is all this making sense? Okay, I'm going to take that as a yes. All right, so some data sources, and we talked about this a little bit, um, but if you're looking for the full population of an area for like an age or a gender group, the American Community Survey is really where to get this, an American Fact Finder. Um, and if we get to the example at the end that I walk through, I'll show you how I walk through that American Fact Finder. Um, and I'd be curious to know, this is where we usually find out tips and tricks that other people use. So as I'm doing that, please jump in if you have shortcuts that I don't know. Um, but if, you're, if your denominator, as it is for many of our performance measure, is births or women delivering in an area, then you want to go to your vital statistics to get the demographics for d delivering women. Or you go to hospital discharge data, too, to look at de hospital deliveries. And of course, that's going to depend on you know, what proportion of your deliveries are in hospitals, if that's going to represent you know, your general underlying denominator. So here's an example of synthetic estimation from this really um, helpful um, resource that I found that really walks through the process. And I have the URL down here for it, but then also um, in a few slides I'll have a resource slide um, that names the document with the URL. And you might find this really useful because it walks through an example with um, using the National Survey of Children's Health. So I just pulled a few tables from that example to demonstrate um, how this works. Um, so their objective was to estimate overweight obese rates for children um, in Baltimore using National Survey of Children's Health data. So now, um, if you're sitting in Maryland, you know that if you get the Maryland NSCH data, you don't have a geographic identifier for Baltimore. So even though you, know, you may have um, actually enough kids that were surveyed from Baltimore, since it's you know, one of the biggest cities in the state, or probably the biggest city in the state, um, you don't have a geographic identifier to do a direct oh. estimate. Um, so actually, the Data Resource Center um, for Child and Adolescent Health, um, the CAMI group, has been doing a lot of this kind of synthetic estimation with NSCH data to try to get at sub-state estimates of some of these child health indicators. Um, so just to walk through Table 1, this is the NSCH prevalence rate for obese or overweight. Um, and this is just for 10 to 17-year-old kids um, because uh, they restrict data for BMI below that because they've been, uh, the parents have been shown to report so poorly, especially on kids' height under age 10, that they don't believe that BMI estimates are very good. Um, so if you've worked with NSCH, you know that, but um, it's the 10 to 17-year-olds that we estimate obesity and overweight rates um, for, for kids from NSCH. So they choose for, cho chose for the synthetic estimation here to use a cross-section of income, so family household income, which you see in the, um, the columns across the top. These are the typical categories in NSCH, and um, they've been multiply imputed, um, which is kind of nice. If you use one of the imputations, then you don't have any missing data for income. Um, so here it's in four categories. I believe the original is in eight categories. So they've collapsed it down to four categories of income. Um, and then also by race. So you can see this creates 16 um, cells within which they calculated estimates of obesity and overweight. So because they chose 16 cells, that's kind of a lot of cells to divide your state data into, especially if you think of like the um, National Surveys of Children's Health, I think, usually has, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think around 1,600 observations per state. Um, so you can see with the little asterisks, the um, strategy they used was to use the regional rate for o overweight and obesity, which Maryland is um, regionally located in the south, um, according to the regions in the National Survey of Children's Health. So. Um, so you can see they use that 
that um, estimate for the South as a whole, as a region, for the categories that have asterisks, which are actually most of the categories, if you look at that. So it's one, one um, you know, strategy to consider if your state data are not robust enough um, that you could think about using um, the national file with the regional you know, identifier to get at that. Of course, that comes with limitations because it's not as specific to your state's context then, um, but something to consider. Okay, so just to give you a sense of what this table is showing us, um, for black um, children, black non-Hispanic children um, in Maryland living in households at um, 100 to 199% of the federal poverty level, the overweight obesity rate was 80%. Okay, so in table two, here's where you get your child um, population um, estimate. And now it's for Baltimore because this is the area for which we wanted to estimate um, an overweight obesity rate. So they use the American Community Survey, which you can get from the American Fact Finder. And you can see that they have, um, and they matched up the ages. So note that there are 54,028 kids aged 10 to 17 in Baltimore. This is from the census estimates from the American Community Survey. And notice they matched up years pretty well too. They used a three-year American Community Survey estimate from 2010 to 2012. Um, to match with their 2011-2012 National Survey of Children's Health. Um, and a three-year estimate was probably needed here because the one-year estimates from the American Community Survey may not have been stable enough at the city level. Okay, so now what you have in all of these cells is, is simply the number of kids that fall into each of these demographic categories in Baltimore according to the census. So these two pieces of information are going to be combined using the formula that we saw before um, to get an overall estimate of obesity overweight in Baltimore, making the assumption that um, the Maryland or the regional south rates um, by race and um, income can help predict the Baltimore rate given the distribution of race and income in Baltimore. Um, so here's just another version of the, um, of the formula. Sometimes I find with Greek that it, it can help to see it different ways because for some people it clicks one way and some people it clicks another way. So here you're estimating the synthetic prevalence rate for Baltimore um, using a population data source, the American Community Survey. Um, and it's the population in the demographic group R, um, comma I, which in this case, um, there's going to be 16, you know, we're going to sum up over 16. Um, the first one is going to be Hispanics living at less than 100% of the federal poverty level, this group right here, okay? So you're going to take that number, that 777, over the total population. You're going to put the total population of 54,000 in Baltimore here, and then multiply it by the obesity and overweight rate for Hispanics living at less than 100% of the federal poverty level um, from the Maryland NSCH. Okay? Um, and here's just a schematic down here that I thought was kind of helpful. Um, that you can walk through on your own. Um, and here are the final results. Um, and I'll talk through this slide. I just wanted to give you one example. If we were doing black kids um, living in households 100 to 199% of the federal poverty level, um, we want to take the number of black kids from the ACS that are 10 to 17 years old in Baltimore multiply it by the obesity prevalence in Maryland for black kids who are living at um, 100 to 199 percent of the federal poverty level um, in Maryland. And if you multiply those values, if you went back to table one and two, you would see that it's 11,532 kids in that demographic category in Baltimore, multiplied by that 80.2 percent, which we talked about earlier, which was the obesity rate, 
And so there are 9,000, approximately with rounding, 9,253, and I have that circled in the table below. Those are the number of kids aged 10 to 17, the estimated number of kids aged 10 to 17 in Baltimore who are overweight or obese. So here what you have filled in in this table um, are the, you know, the, the actual population numbers for each group, and then you have the total of obese or overweight kids. If you took that total, summing up over all 16 groups after doing this, this formula at the top 16 times, you sum, sum all of them up, divide them by the population estimate, and you get an overall prevalence of obesity for Baltimore of 49.2%. So the authors go on to say they did this for, you know, all of these different areas across the United States. Um, and then you can estimate the different areas and see where, um, where obesity prevalence estimates are 35% or higher. And it looks like uh, my geography is not great. Is that Baltimore, the, the one that's lighting up right there? I think probably. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to go back here for one second. Were there any questions on how the synthetic estimation is done? Okay, I just wanted to show you, you know, one more thing from that publication. They were looking, they drilled down into the Atlanta area and looked at counties in the Atlanta metropolitan area and looked at variation there too. So you can think about all the different possible applications for this, um, whether you're at the state level and you want to look at county differences or health service area differences. Um, or city differences, um, or if you're at the county or city level, you may want to look at neighborhood level differences in these factors, in which case you would use the American Fact Finder to look um, probably for census tract demographics. So here's just a screenshot of American Fact Finder. Um, as I mentioned before, the ACS um, has one-year, three-year, and five-year estimates. Um, the one-year estimates, I think, usually work um, at the county level. So you see, um, I just took a screenshot here. I was looking at the 2015 one-year ACS estimates. And I, I looked at ge geographies available to me, and you can see that some of them are grayed out. So for the one year, you can only really get, well, you can get region within the United States, you can get state, but you can get county at a sub-state level. But you see, you can't get census tract or block group. Those are grayed out. And you can't get, um, I think, you know, many of the cities, the MSAs um, at this point, because the sample size is not stable enough with one year of the American Community Survey, which is, you know, the sample survey that is uh, replacing, you know, the, the census. But if I had chosen the, the five-year estimates, you know, from 2010 to 2015, I would then get census tract as an available um, level of geography. So you can see there's a balance here, too, about whether you get kind of, you know, if you know that your, you know, neighborhoods in your city underwent extreme changes in the past five years um, due to either gentrification or due to, you know, um, you know, economic issues such as closing of factories or things like that, um, and that it really has changed quite a bit in that short, like, five-year time frame, you might not want to rely on five-year estimates for demographics. So these are all the kind of considerations you want to want to make. So with synthetic estimation, you can make more complex synthetic estimates um, by using multivariable stratification or um, regression analysis. Um, so you could initially model the relationship between an indicator and factors related to it um, in a larger area, like at the state level, um, then apply the beta estimates from this model to the small area of interest. So really plugging in to the regression equation the X's for your county. 
So the way that would work, um, so suppose you want estimates of insurance status for neighborhoods within a city, but you only have data on insurance status for cities in the state. So you'd first model the relationship between insurance status as your dependent variable and predictor variables that are highly correlated with insurance status, but also that you have available at the neighborhood level from an external data source. And then you can use the estimates from the resulting regression equations to calculate an estimate of insurance status in neighborhoods by plugging in the neighborhood values for the x's into the equation. Um, I don't have a, um, an applied example of this, and, and just because you're running a regression model doesn't mean that you're not concerned about stability of estimates. Um, so it's still important to think about, you can only have you know, so many predictors in the, in the model depending on your sample size. But um, just a, a quick example of how this might work in practice is that if you were estimating the percent uninsured in, um, in the city, you, it, and you regressed, um, you regressed uninsured yes, no um, to the percent unemployed um, across cities in your state, then you would get the beta coefficients of here you would get 4.31 as your intercept and 3.81 as your beta 1 for the, pers um, for the unemployment rate in that city in, across cities. So then you could actually use those estimates and then at a neighborhood level, if you know the unemployment rate at the neighborhood level, um, you could plug in that 4% for your neighborhood of interest and estimate the percent uninsured in the neighborhood. So if you plug in the 3.84 um, times 4 for that 4% uninsurance rate and you add it to the, um, the intercept, you would get an uninsurance uh, an uninsured rate of 19.6 for your neighborhood in, of interest. And that's a synthetic estimate of that. Um, so you can see how you could take it from doing it in a very um, stratified table-based way, um, like I did earlier, um, to a regression approach um, if you're using you know, one or more predictors. And you should get um, similar results, and you should still be also mindful of, um, you know, of cell sizes, so of really cutting your data too thin. So the one thing that a regression equation doesn't take into account, unless you're, um, you're actually going to model an interaction term, is if the, um, the estimates differ, you know, simultaneously by two factors. So in our example from before about obesity, if, they, if the estimates vary by race and income, then unless you estimate an um, interaction term in your model, you're going to kind of be ignoring that variation. Um, so I think if you're new to synthetic estimation, it's best to start out kind of with the table-based approach. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of great resources out there for it. Of course, there's many limitations, and you really need to be mindful of these um, and not overinterpret those, those findings. If you've noticed, I've really been trying to like, remind myself to say estimates, estimates, because um, you know, these aren't based on um, you know, actual direct estimation, actual data collected in those geographic sub-areas. So a few assumptions. Synthetic estimates assume that the prevalence rate or the people in different demographic groups in local areas match those um, at the state level. So um, what that means is that it assumes that black kids that are um, at 100, and 100 to 199 percent of the federal poverty level in Baltimore would have the same obesity prevalence rate as um, you know, black kids who are at 100 to 199 percent of the federal poverty level in Maryland, right? You're making that assumption. Also, if there's sampling error in the state level prevalence rate, um, the, it may be compounded at the local level um, in the final synthetic estimates. And that's why we're talking about making sure that those estimates within the fine demographic groups are stable enough so that you, ha um, you can be, you know, um, more confident in those estimates themselves at the state level. Um, and then synthetic estimates can't be used for program evaluation and don't account for areas with programs or risk factors that have strong local impact. 
So say you have like a really great program targeting obesity um, in, in Baltimore, um, then the Maryland rates may not reflect the Baltimore rates very well because you may have, you know, really successfully, you know, prevented some, um, some overweight or obesity in kids in Baltimore. And man, don't we wish, I mean, this is a kind of idealistic example um, because we don't have a lot of really successful um, policies or programs to reduce childhood obesity right now. But you can, you can think about this in your own area of interest. You have a particular community that does really well on an indicator despite their maybe um, high risk demographic profile, either because there's been an intervention there or there's some other um, you know, kind of protective factor in the community. Um, and the same goes, you might have a community that um, maybe doesn't look like the highest risk community, but um, you know, maybe there is a, you know, an environmental pollutant that, it ha that is making asthma rates higher in that community than they would be otherwise in the state for that same pattern of dem demographics. Um, so you really want to make those considerations and think about those as, as limitations. And you, don't, you obviously don't want to evaluate a program because you're not going to see the effect of the program um, at the community level if you're using state estimates. Okay, so here are some of the um, resources that I mentioned. Um, the first one is the one where I showed the example from um, overweight and obesity. There's, it drills down even more, um, and that's available online. And then there's a couple different resources um, from the Data Resource Center for Child and Adolescent Health. So all of these resources are based on the National Survey of Children's Health, but all the same principles apply um, for synthetic estimation. Okay, so now I'm going to move to multi-level modeling. Um, but before I do, just any questions about synthetic estimation? Kristen, would you like me to unmute mute the lines if people wanted to ask a question or just move on? Um, you don't have to, but if anybody out there does want to ask a question, you can just press star 7. And I'll give you a second to do that. Hello? Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, this is Kristen Larder from Michigan. Um, you mentioned that to, uh, this can be used for evaluation. Um, how about like um, benchmarking or not, sorry, not benchmarking, the like target setting and, and kind of change over time in, in indicators? Would that be, I guess, in, at the local level or would be probably pretty difficult to to justify like sample size wise, but um, the example you gave was using the obesity rates. Um, but I'm thinking, sorry, I guess maybe my question's not quite that put together. <laughs> no, I no, I totally get what you're saying. Um, yeah, I think it would be tricky to hold a you know. Um, a, a county or a city or a, you know a, um, another jurisdiction accountable to meeting a target and be using synthetic estimates to estimate that. I mean, maybe you could use it to to set a target, but um, you know it's all going to be based on you know state level data or you know or county level data for your smaller community. Um, so I think it would be difficult to kind of hold a state accountable to that if they weren't actual real estimates. So I don't know. I, um, does anybody else have any thoughts about that? I think it's a little bit more useful maybe for kind of like um, needs assessment or identifying communities that might have, you know, higher rates of a particular indicator. But if you were really going to monitor over time, you know, progress toward um, toward a target, um, I, I think it would be difficult to hold, you know, hold them accountable based on, because if the rest of the state's not doing well, it's going to affect their estimates at the local level, even if they've done, you know, you know, improved rates, you know, at their sub sub state level. Does that make sense? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, it does make sense. I guess maybe I'm thinking the challenge might be communicating that to folks who are um, like policymakers and, and maybe program leaders too. So thanks, so that helps. Yeah, I know. I'm always very torn about these synthetic estimates um, because of all the, the limitations. Um, but it's kind of like, do we throw the baby out with the bathwater because we have no other options for so many of these indicators? So it's just, I think, important to use them with caution and to use them for for some purposes, but probably not others. And you're right, the communication is the, uh, always the challenging part. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I think I'm going to move on to multi-level modeling. Um, so this is an approach that you can use if you do have geographic identifiers, um, but you don't have you know, enough sample size within each geographic unit to produce stable estimates. So like we said before, PRAMS and BRFSS are really good examples of this. Sometimes vital statistics, if you have really small you know, areas with small numbers of births, um, and here you can use you know, both individual and area level variables um, as predictors. So when I'm talking about area level variables, again, you might get those from the ACS and it could be the percent of high school graduates in your, um, in your area, the unemployment rate, the in uninsured children, the families in poverty. So you would be able to link um, those um, area level kind of um, you know, social determinants of health at a, at a neighborhood or a county level from the census with your individual level data according to that geographic identifier. So a woman in County A in PRAMS would be linked to her neighborhood's data. Um, and so and then you have to merge, well, I talked about that already. You merge it to create that multi-level data set. And what multi-level modeling produces is something called composite estimates. And a composite estimate is a weighted average, or sometimes called a shrinkage estimate, of both a direct and an indirect estimate. Um, and they're typically area specific and cross area. So the direct estimate actually borrows strength from the indirect estimate. And the goal is to simultaneously take advantage of the unbiasedness of the direct estimate and the reliability of the indirect estimate. So the weights for this kind of composite estimate are going to be based on sample size and variability in the small area. The smaller the sample size and greater the variability, the smaller the weight is given to that local data and the more weight is given to a cross area or other external data. So if we were doing counties in Illinois, um, the estimate of the indicator of interest, so which is going to be the dependent variable in the multi-level model, is going to be weighted more heavily to the estimate for Cook County, where Chicago than it would be for um, Sagamon County, where Springfield sits. And Sagamon County would be um, weighted more heavily than um, Knox County, which is a more rural county in our state. Um, and empirical Bayes estimates, um, th this is one approach to assigning weights to the direct and indirect estimates. So this is the one I'm going to show today. Um, but I think there are different ways to kind of weight the data um, that are beyond the scope of this webinar because I don't know them. <laughs> um, so this is kind of a schematic of what a shrinkage estimate is. On the left, you have the actual observed county rates. So in Knox County, we may have, you know, one woman of reproductive age who was, or maybe even zero women who were surveyed in the BRFSS. Um, but you know, if there was one woman, we're basing our county estimate on whether she got or did not get our estimate, so say the well woman visit. So it's either 100% or 0% with an N of 1. But in Cook County, we may have, um, I'm trying to come up with something reasonable, you know, hundreds of women that were sampled for BRFSS, and we have an estimate of 60% getting a well woman visit. So you have this range of observed county rates and you see how variable they are according to the schematic. And then you have the state rate, the overall for Illinois, what's the state rate. Um, and then your estimated, your shrinkage estimates are going to borrow um, from, the indirect, from the observed county rates and the overall state rate to give you something in between for each county. 
So it's going to pull that 100% for Knox County down closer to the overall state rate, which maybe is 65% or something. So like I said, multi-level modeling is one way we can produce these shrinkage estimates. And we're de declaring a higher level variable um, as a random intercept, um, borrowing strength from the higher level inf information. Um, so if census tracts are declared as our unit of analysis, maybe we have Chicago data and we want to get estimates for, you know, we have vital statistics and we have Chicago identified and we want to get estimates for our, for census tracts in Chicago. Now some census tracts may have a sufficient number of births and others may not. So if census tracts are a unit of analysis, then if we allow each tract to have its own random intercept, it's going to account for the varying sample size in each tract and yield census tract estimates that borrow from that overall Chicago estimate. So here is what the equation looks like. This is a logistic regression model. So we're taking the um, the natural log or the um, log uh, the natural log of the odds of the um, the indicator, so the log it, um, and this is the indicator. So now you have the subscript ij um, because you have at the individual and at the census tract level. So you have individuals individual i nested within census tract j, um, and then you see equals um, the x ij times beta which is going to be the vector of all of the predictors you have in the model, the betas and the x's, plus um, this uh, random intercept. Okay. So in order to do that, um, in, I just have SAS code here, but if, you, um, if you're a Stata user, you can go back to the kind of multi-level modeling slides that we had on site um, to look at how you would run a random intercept model there. Um, Proclimix is going to run with, with this link equals logit. We're going to get a logistic regression model with distribution equals binomial. Um, here is an example of what we call an empty model. Notice there are no predictors in this model. We're just modeling low birth weight rates. Um, we have census tract as the class variable to indicate that that's a categorical variable. So there, even though census tract is um, the codes are numbers, we're going to treat this as categorical because it's not truly a numeric variable. And then you see the random intercept um, statement um, and subject equals census tract. So what this means is that a, a different intercept which is going to be a different natural log of the odds of low birth weight is going to produ be produced for each census tract from this model. And that estimate of that intercept for each census tract is going to use the information for the census tract, but then also use the information for across all census tracts to come up with something, an estimate that's kind of somewhere in the middle and more stable. This output statement is going to output those estimates um, and, and the predicted values for those estimates. So if we get the predicted values, those are actually going to be the low birth weight rates for each census tract into an output data set called CTS. Okay. And if you're using the, this code later, you know, please remember that we're available for technical assistance. If you want to try this out and you have any questions, just email, email me. Here's just an example of the output from that empty model. And here we're going to get um, the, the um, intercept in red here. Um, that's the overall intercept for the model. And then you'll get the interclass correlation. Do you remember this from back on site? Um, this means that uh, the 6% the of the overall variation in birth weight, um, in low birth weight actually, is accounted for at the census tract level. So there's not much clustering at the census tract as we'd expect. About 6% of the variation is at the census tract level. Um, and then the, the intercept of negative 2.12 is the overall intercept. That's the log odds of low birth weight for the whole sample. And then in your output data set, I'm just showing an excerpt here. You have, we have 855 census tracts in Chicago, so you see census tract 1. The N for that census tract was 117. If we just took the observed low birth weight rate, here's the direct estimate for census tract 1. It's 16.2%. 
here's the empirical Bayes estimate. So here's that random intercept. Um, here's the predicted probability that you could calculate from the random intercept produced from the model for census tract one. Um, and here is the, um, the difference, you know, and here's, here's it on an odd scale, here's it on a um, proportion, proportion scale, and then here's the difference between the observed and the estimated proportion. So you see that um, the observed proportion is higher than the estimated proportion um, because it's, it's kind of shrinking. It's coming somewhere in between the direct estimate and the overall estimate for the city of Chicago. And you notice for a census tract like census tract four, which only has an N of 36, the difference is, is more pronounced between the direct estimate and the empirical Bayes estimate, the, the um, shrinkage estimate. Okay, so it looks like they have a really, really low, low birth weight rate, but it's only based on 36 observations. So the shrinkage estimate pulls it more toward the overall city estimate of low birth weight rate. Questions? Star seven, if you have them. Okay, I'm going to show you one more example, and this is from Amy Salzman's work um, in Wisconsin. Um, just an, another example of how to approach this. So, oh, I did want to point out, remember it was an empty model? So really, I wasn't utilizing any, any independent variables to improve my prediction. Um, of the low birth weight rates in, in the census tracts within Chicago. Um, but if you wanted to, you could put some variables in the right side of the model, and it would probably improve the prediction of um, those census tract level estimates, because then you would actually be drawing on the demographic distribution in that census tract, and you'd be able to um, better predict at the local level what those estimates would be. And that's what Amy did in Wisconsin. Um, she ran a two-level logistic regression model, just like we saw before. In this case, she's using state data, um, but the, the unit of analysis is the county level. So her random intercept, the subject is going to equal the county identifier in Wisconsin. And so she'll get as many random intercepts as she gets um, um, counties. And then she'll also get beta estimates for, um, um, for the different predictors that she adds to the model. So she'll be able to solve that equation for each county based on their individual demographics and their individual random intercept. So what she wanted to do was predict the probability of infants ever breastfed, which was one of the national performance measures in Wisconsin in each Wisconsin county. She's using PRAMS data, which has county level identifiers, but not enough sample size in each county. Um, and at the individual level, she used predictors such as race, ethnicity, maternal education, parity, and smoking as, um, as factors that are highly correlated with ever breastfeeding rates um, in order to make a better prediction at the county level. And at the county level, she did merge in data from the census on the percent uninsured children and the percent un unemployed. Now, she went through a lot of, um, you know, selecting this model is, um, is a challenge that we're not really going to get into much today, but we've talked about previously, like what, how should we select a model? Should it be conceptually based? Should it be empirically based? Probably somewhere in between. Amy went through and looked at a lot of different county level and individual level estimates and was really trying to optimize the prediction of ever being breastfed. And so you can think about building this model maybe a little bit different um, you know, than if you were building a model to test a hypothesis because you're really trying to, to get as many factors you can that are correlated with ever breastfeeding to make the prediction better. Um, so I'm sure, you know, we could have an argument about what should be in this model or not, but I know she went through many different models and found this one to predict ever breastfeeding pretty well. Um, so then she applied this code, um, so we, here we see it again. Um, you can see the random intercept portion of the Glimex procedure with subject equals MAMRAS. That was her variable for county code. And notice she had it in the class statement as well. 
Um, and then you see her model is much more complicated than that empty, empty model we looked at before. Because, and hopefully she'll get a better prediction at the county level than she would if she just did you know, an empty model. And here's just a sample. Oh, and she has the output st statement too. But here's just a sample of her results for different counties. Um, for county A, her county intercept was 1.49. But then once you plugged in all of the x values for county A, so the, um, you know, the percent who smoked, the percent who spoke English. Oh, it looks like she has primary language in here too. Um, the, the unemployment rate, all of the different factors, she plugged in with the beta estimates to the equation using that county estimate and got a predicted probability of 81.6%. And actually, she didn't have to do all that work because this PRED statement here is actually going to produce that for her. So in the output data set, for each county, she should have the predicted probability of ever breastfed. And you know, she did actually for her capstone project, she compared it to the direct estimate in counties where she had sufficient amount of data to do that. So um, I, I can't remember which counties these were because I wasn't supposed to identify them. <laughs> um, but you can think about Wisconsin, you know, where, where Milwaukee sits. I, I don't remember what county that is, but like Dane County where Madison sits. You can imagine that they might have enough women in the PRAMS data. Maybe not if in one year, but if you collapse two years of data or something like that, you could get a direct estimate. So for the counties that had sufficient sample size, she just compared her empirical Bayes estimates to the direct estimates. But for counties that she doesn't have enough, you know, she doesn't have that option. So this is the, the, the strength of using these shrinkage estimates. Any questions about multi-level modeling? So I've got to get rid of all these arrows. I just wanted to point out some more kind of sophisticated applications of these um, that I, I wouldn't be able to do myself, but are great sources of data um, you know, for small area estimates of certain indicators that really smart people at, and smart teams at the census and at CDC are doing. Um, so the small area health insurance estimates, um, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with these. Um, are calculated by the Census Bureau, and they use um, American Community Survey data um, at smaller, you know, subunits, um, smaller geographic subunits, um, uh, well, to predict uninsurance rates for smaller demographic subunits. So they do this, I think, by congressional dis district. So if you think about local data for local action, um, that's really, really useful. Um, and they do it for every county in the USA and then some smaller um, sub-counties and their single year estimates. So they use ACS estimates of percent on insurance, but then they use area level data um, to improve using shrinkage estimates the prediction of the percent uninsured. And then they also um, enhance it with other administrative data. So here's where it gets really complicated within a hierarchical Bayesian framework. So they actually incorporate data from the IRS, from SNAP, from um, Medicaid and CHIP um, to improve those insurance estimates at that smaller level. Um, so it's interesting. If you ever, um, if you really want to geek out one day, you can go to the methodology document and see exactly how they do it. Um, but it's also a great source of data at a smaller level. And it's pretty, usually pretty current. Um, I mean, within a year or two, which, I mean, is pretty current as things go. Another thing I wanted to point out that I don't know a lot about, but, um, but I know is ongoing, is the CDC 500 Cities Project, where they're planning to estimate measures for 27 um, chronic disease indicators. Um, and you can go to the website and see what all the different indicators are. But there's five unhealthy behaviors, 13 health outcomes, nine prevention practices. And they use BRFIS as the basis. And they're doing this for cities and small areas within some cities. Um, and they use like a more sophisticated version of the multilevel regression that I was just discussing. And I just also put a link, I put a link to the overall website because the data will be available, they say, in spring of 2017. Um, and then there's also a link to the validation paper that shows how they kind of validated their model for this. So you see it can get much more sophisticated than what we discussed. Um, but this should hopefully give you a start and give you some ideas. 
Um, I am going to switch to sharing my screen so I can just show you kind of like step by step through a synthetic estimation um, example in the last few minutes we have. But as I'm doing that, please feel free to push star seven and um, ask any questions you may have about multi-level modeling because I will be going off of that topic. Hey, Christian. Hey, Christian. Yes? I have a quick question. Um, going back to the code for prox limics, can you talk a little bit about that solution option? I think you had um, mentioned it, but I think I missed it. Um, I think I'm remembering this right, but um, I think by default in Glimix, for some reason, I might be wrong about this, so you guys can correct me, but I think by default in Glimix, you actually don't get to see all the beta coefficients from the model. Like you see the model um, fit statistics and everything like that, but unless you put solution, you don't see the parameter estimates, which I think is bizarre. Um, but you know, I guess you're actually, in this case, you're actually not directly using the beta coefficient. So if you left solution off, you would still get in your output data set the predicted probabilities. But I think that's what that option means. Okay, thank you. Sure. And like I said, if you start to apply any of this code, you know, and I have questions or about interpretation or anything like that, just please, uh, please get in touch with me. And if I can't answer it, I will find somebody who can. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen now. Oh, and you're seeing a poster that you shouldn't be seeing. Okay. So here you should see some SAS code, which I'm going to go through just really quickly. Um, but I created a very quick and dirty example looking at the well woman visit using Burfus data from 2013 in Illinois. And I'm um, taking the, the overall um, data and trying to estimate for census tracts within Cook County, um, which is the county where Chicago sits, and um, there's sub suburban areas within Cook, too. So just kind of a fake example here, um, but I wanted to walk through it for you. So here's the Burfitt's file. I did some recoding here um, to get factors of interest. So one is that there's a variable for um, the outcome of did you have a, how long ago was your last checkup? I recoded this into this well woman visit variable means they got one in the last year or they didn't. So this is actually according to the federally available data document, the FAD that MCHB put out um, that defines the well woman visit indicator for the national performance measure. Um, we're actually looking within the past year, did the women of reproductive age get a preventive visit? Um, I, I was trying to think of individual level factors that might predict getting a visit. Um, and here's where this might not be the best example, because if you think about kind of geographic variation, I mean, I may want to incorporate, um, well, you can't in, synthet in synthetic estimation. So, you know, there might be geographic variation in access to care. So this might be the type of indicator that this isn't, you know, won't work as well for. Um, given that there are going to be features of the community in terms of health service access that might affect rates of well woman care. Um, so I'm undermining my whole example here, but just giving you things to, to think through and um, I'll still show you the mechanics using this example. So I thought about health insurance status. So here I just have a dichotomous variable for coverage. Um, covered or not, yes or no. Um, and then I thought age of the woman might influence whether or not she got a well woman visit. And these three age categories are not very well documented, but the first one is 18 to 24, then I have 25 to 34, and 35 to 44. So in the federally available data, docu in the FAD document, um, it says the national performance measure is for women age 18 to 44 um, because the birth is starts at age 18. Um, so now I've divided them into three categories, and what I did was made sure when I went to American Fact Finder that I could get underlying demographic information for census tracts based on those same three categories. Um, and then I created a variable for Cook, and then I created a variable for female. I used Proc Survey Freak um, to cross, and remember with, um, you know, you, you're not supposed to with 
complex sample survey data, restrict your data set because that messes up the standard error calculations. So here what I did was I crossed Cook by female, by age cap, by coverage, and well woman visit to get just the women in Cook County um, by the three age groups, by the health insurance coverage yes, no, and there the last variable is going to provide for me the row percent um, for the proportion who got a well woman visit in each of those categories. Um, so that output, and so the reason I did Cook here is because now I'm getting, you know, the, I had enough sample size with, well, actually, I don't. Um, because if you look, if I run this, I'll show you. Um, now you see the output for complex sample survey data is um, always a little um, tricky to uh, orient yourself to, and especially when you don't have your data formatted like I don't here. But what we're looking at here is for women in the first age category, 18 to 24, who don't have health coverage, the row percent for well woman visit is 50.5%. But look at my, um, look at here my uh, sample sizes. When I just look in Cook County by these different by these um, six different categories, I have pretty low sample size, and my weighted estimates, which are the row percents, are based on very little data. So while ideally, if I was estimating at the census tract level for getting a well woman visit, um, I would want to use the overall estimate of Cook County because it's likely to be different than the Illinois estimate. However, in just one year of BRFIS data, um, I really can't trust these estimates um, given the small sample sizes. So I, what I did is I went back and used just Illinois as a whole. So if I took the Cook stratifier off of here, I could rerun this and get more stable sample sizes um, in each of the cells. Okay. Um, so that's the, so now I've got my prevalence estimates and I summarized them in an Excel table. I'm going to be doing everything else here in Excel. So bear with me. Here I summarize the prevalence of a well woman visit um, in each of my six categories created by the, um, the combination of um, age and insurance coverage. Okay, um, so I'm going to use the Illinois estimates, even though the Cook estimates might be more relevant to my sub area of interest. I didn't have multiple years of data to combine to make those more stable, so I went ahead and used the Illinois estimates. And you can see they don't vary too much, but there are some, some clear differences. So then, and so now I have my prevalence estimates for the state for my six different demographic categories. Now I'm going to go to American Fact Finder to get the demographics in each census tract. And I do want to mention that it's um, now it's 2.30 central time, and I know we're supposed to end now, so if you have to sign off, please don't worry, and if you have questions afterwards, please follow up with me by email. Um, I'll probably just go about another eight to ten minutes with this example if you do want to hang on. So um, if you just search American Fact Finder in Google, you'll come up to this, and. Um, one way, there's many different ways to get at the data. One way is through an advanced search. Um, and I'm going to say show me all. Right. So you'll come up to this kind of queryable table. Um, and many of you may have used this before, so forgive me if this is review. Um, but the first way I wanted to approach this was by geography. So if I go to geography, um, I'm going to um, select a geographic type. I'm going to pick census tract. Um, and then I select my, it has me select my state, Illinois, and then my county. So here I'm just going to pick Cook. If I wanted all the census tracts in the state, I could have picked all. And so I'm going to pick all the census tracts within Cook County and add this to my selection. So you'll see your running filter will go along the side here on the left. Um, and you'll see that I'm looking at all census tracts within Cook County, Illinois. Now if I go to topics, 
there's a million different possible topics. But if we go under people, remember what I'm looking for here is insurance coverage status and um, age distribution, but I also need to incorporate gender so that I don't get males in here. So um, I'm going to pick age and sex. Um, And then I'm also going to pick insurance coverage. And now it's going to take, you know, it's filtering each time. Um, I'm going to pick a year, and I'm going to pick 2013 because that matches up with my BRFAS data. And you can see as I'm filtering, I'm getting less and less um, options in my, uh, in my box here. So what I'm looking for is health insurance coverage by age and sex. Um, and it's just, in this case, I'm just looking at health insurance coverage overall, not by type. Oh, it was right up here. So health insurance coverage status by sex by age, if I click on this one, it's going to produce a table for me um, for all of the different age categories. Um, and this is where you're kind of at the at the um, mercy of the system if you're going to query this way. Now you have options to download data um, if you want to get you know, more refined age categories. And again, that's something I can help with. I usually have to kind of um, feel my way through that process. But I've done it before where I've gotten the breakdown by single age categories. Um, for census tracts within Chicago. But then you have to go through a process where you're um, downloading more raw data, and sometimes it'll take a little bit longer to get to have the file ready for you and be able to download. But if you're just using, in this case, I'm lucky because the age categories are 18 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44. They're the same as I created in BRFIS. Um, but I have it for males, I have for kids, I have all the way up to, you know, um, 75 and over, um, but if I export, if I download this data file, and the first thing I wanted uh, that I realized I need to do is modify the table and flip the columns and the rows, because otherwise it won't let me download, because um, there were so many columns, because there's, remember there's like 855 census tracts um, in Cook County. And then you would download, um, and I downloaded it as an, as an Excel file. And, and then you go and open it. And now this is going to be the blue, 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 blue. We're going <laughs> to advance in time to when I have a, a completed version of this. <laughs> um, first of all, I'll show you what the actual file looks like from, um, from the download. So you have something that looks like this. And now you can clean it up to restrict to just the, the females of um, 18 to 44 age groups, um, and uh, you know, I, I thought there should be, if anybody knows how to not download the margin of error, um, because while it's important to understand variability, it kind of messes up your, um, your spreadsheet. Um, but basically, I cleaned this up kind of manually um, and ended up with only the data I needed, which was the number for each census tract in Chicago the number of women in each age category with health insurance and without health insurance. So the six columns that I have highlighted here are the six demographic categories and the number of women in each of those demographic categories for each census tract. And then what I did was took my estimates that we saw before for Illinois BRFSS. For those six categories, I put them here, and I just you know, to get them on all of them, I just dragged it down because it's going to be the same estimate for each census tract. We're using the Illinois estimates by age and health insurance coverage um, to apply to the geographic distribution, um, I mean the demographic distribution by age and the health insurance coverage for females um, in census tract from the ACS. So, so when I took that file from the ACS, I got rid of all the male data, all the kid data, all the 45 and older data, um, and just kept these population estimates. So now once you have that all set up, it's, it's all about just, you can see the formula I have in here. 
Um, what I'm doing here is computing the number of women with a well woman visit in census tract, in the first census tract 101, um, among women who are 18 to 24 year olds with, with health insurance. So to do that, I'm just taking um, the 63.2% here in cell M4, dividing it by 100 because it's expressed as a, a percent and we want it as a proportion. So you see the M4 divided by 100. And then we're multiplying by E4. Well, what's in E4? Um, E4, if we go back, is the number of women with health insurance covered in, in Census Tract 101 who are 18 to 24 years old. So you see we're just really creating kind of a, um, a weight here. Um, and we're doing that for all six categories and then summing them up. So for each of these, this is the number of women in that census tract in each of these six demographic categories who had a well woman visit. We sum it up to 830. Oops, sorry. And then we're taking the 830 dividing by the total number of women um, in the census tract to get a well woman visit rate of 62% for census tract 101. So if we go back, this I'm summing here over the columns, which were the, um, the full population denominators across the six groups. And that's our synthetic estimate. And you can see that the synthetic estimates vary across census tracts in Chicago. Not by a lot, um, but maybe if I had chosen factors that were more predictive than health, just health insurance coverage and age, um, you know, I could have gotten more variation in these estimates. And also remember this is the, you know, there is the underlying limitation here that across Chicago there's differences in access to care in different neighborhoods. There's a different amount of travel time to clinics to get these services. There's also, you know, a lot of other factors that may influence these rates that aren't accounted for in the synthetic estimate. So I hope that was um, helpful just to see kind of how you would go through the whole process of going out to get the ACS data, matching it with your survey data, even if it wasn't maybe the, the best conceptual example, um, is mechanically this is how it works. So I'll, I'm available if you have any more questions, just press star 7. Um, and uh, while you're doing that, I'll just say we look forward to having you for the December call, which um, will be again focused on um, economic analysis, and Scott Gross from CDC will be doing that. And remember, we're always available by email if you need any technical assistance. So I'll give one more minute for any final questions. I hope this was helpful, um, and I hope to hear from you guys that you're trying this out yourselves and seeing how it works. Maureen, did you want to close up? Sure, Kristen. Thank you so much. Um, just checking to see if there's any other questions. Nope. Okay. So thank you again and for the shout out for the December call or webinar, which will take place on December 19th and will be the final webinar of the 2016 course. So um, with that, thank you all for hanging, hanging on those few extra minutes. Kristen, thank you for a fabulous presentation, and I'll look forward to reengaging with all of you next month. Bye-bye.